the Braves beat writer for the AJC. It's Justin Toscano. Justin, thank you so much here for joining me here on a Sunday, man. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well, man. But I could be better because the Braves have been struggling here against the Mets, and that's really what I want to get into first here. Hasn't been the series a Braves fan such as myself has wanted to see when it comes to such a big series that this is really and has been for the Braves trying to get back into the NL East, maybe even take over the lead. But now we're just in the position where we're just trying to salvage this series. So, Justin, what is it about the Mets this year that have caused the Braves so many problems this year? Uh, they execute really well in pretty much all phases of the game. I mean, they've got star power at the top of the rotation with Max Scherzer and now Jacob DeGrom, who's pitching today. Uh, Carlos Carrasco has had a much better season than he did last year, as has Taiwan Walker, save for Friday's poor start. Um, and they've got Chris Bassett. And they've even got rotation depth. So the guy who shut the, Mets, or the, the Braves down in game one of yesterday's doubleheader, David Peterson, actually isn't a part of their top five or even really top six in the rotation. So they've just got a ton of depth. And then offensively, same deal. I mean, they used to strike out a lot. They used to have, like, one of the highest chase rates in the league last year, and they just go with this year. They make contact, and they make quality contact. Um, you can talk about all the infield hits they have or all the soft contact, but when you're putting the ball in play, you kind of create issues for the opposing team. And we saw that in uh, game two yesterday where Austin Riley had to make a tough play toward home plate and one tough one to, you know, throw to first. Uh, they had to try to turn a tough double play on a ball that got away from Max Freed. I mean, stuff like that creates issues for teams. And, and they 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 have the balance in the lineup now. They've got power and Pete Alonso and Diego Pogobos, even Francisco and Dora. But they've also got some high OBG guys and guys who are going to work counts. And they just made it really tough on uh, Braves pitching. And when you look at, I mean, the weakest part of their team is probably the bullpen. But they they still got Edwin Diaz, who's the best closer in baseball right now. Um, so yeah, they they execute really well and. I mean, I think the Braves are, you know, every bit as talented as the Mets. And probably right. maybe if you want to consider the bullpen. But I just think through these first four games, the Braves, for the most part, have been just thoroughly outplayed. I'd agree. And uh, I've, seen, I've seen this a lot. It seems like the Mets have really just been executing better. And then, like you said about their ABs, they're really impatient on their at-bats more than they've ever been in the past couple of years. Foul a lot of balls off, just have a lot of patient hitters on that team and like you said about the soft contact too I mean that's why you put the ball in play you make the defense work and speaking of putting the ball in play I guess the one bright side the one silver lining maybe that has come about in this series is Ronald Acuna Jr. he looks like he might be rounding back into form obviously had that four hit game in the nine to six victory that we had in the second game of the series he talked about couple days ago not fully trusting his knee and maybe not completely being over that ACL tear but do you think we are starting to see him trust his knee now just in a few days do you think we're starting to see Ronald Acuna Jr. become what we know Ronald Acuna Jr. can be yeah yeah for sure um I don't know what's going through his head but I think you have a checklist of things maybe like Brian Snickers mentioned a checklist of things with an injury like that in your own mind that you want to see get done. I think he's starting to trust me a little bit more. He made that play robbing the two-run homer from Pete Alonso uh, a couple nights ago. And, and just seeing that he can do those sorts of things in the field. We've seen, I think, three plays from him in the last four days that have been better than probably any that he made before that this season. So he's really getting back to trust in that. You can see that he's seeing that, you know, that won't result in another injury. A play going back to the wall, almost like the one where he tore his ACL on things like that, um, and learning to be okay with those and having those experiences and knowing that, you know, they'll be fine, they're not going to cause another injury, and, and stuff like that can be tough. And then at the plate, yeah, he just looks like a junior more. He was impacting more balls in the last home stand, um, and he's continued to do that here in New York. I mean, he really looks the force at the top of the lineup, and you're seeing, you kind of seeing the high energy come back to him now with, with some of those hits, and he had that home run that fell into the home run apple. Um, so, yeah, he, he's been really good. He has been the you know, one of the, the only bright spots at this point for a lineup that is kind of struggling against Mets pitching is that Roman Cooney is giving the Mets some fit through, you know, four of these five games. Completely agree. It's Justin Toscano, Brace beat writer for the AJC, joining us here on the WadeFord.com hotline, Atlanta's Ford dealer, hometown take here on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. And Justin, from one guy who's been dealing with a injury problem to another, and he's not really dealing with it anymore, so maybe that's not the best phrase to say. But Tyler Matzik, 
Obviously, he had an injury earlier this year, and recently he, he's kind of been struggling. So I want to ask you if that's really just the ebbs and flows that we see throughout the season, or is there a real cause for concern from what we're seeing with Tyler Matzik? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's the kind of black and reliever. Those guys go through spurts, uh, kind of ups and downs. I mean, I think he should be fine. The most important part is that they can allow him to push through it in situations that usually aren't going to be high leverage unless their bullpen is completed. They have Kenley Jansen, Rysele Glessius, AJ Minter. They're going to soon add Kirby Yates. Um, so all of those guys are guys who have pitched in the late innings before, um, guys who have gotten saves in their career. And they'll have the Braves who soon have three former closers, uh, current closers on their team. And so, I mean, I think the, the important part is, yeah, a lot of big things still in ebbs and flows. And, and look, you know, somebody, he had a terrific postseason. I think that's what everybody expected him to be. And I think he can be that to a certain degree, at least better than what he's been. But uh, I think it's just, you know, they go through ups and downs. Relievers go through cycles like that. It's, they're very volatile. It's, it's hard to stay successful for a long time as a reliever. They always go through those spurts. Um, we see it with literally everybody from Josh Hader to the worst reliever in the league. So I, I think he'll be fine. The more important part to me is that the Braves can certainly afford to keep running him out there in situations that aren't high leverage because they have so many other guys to fix those great spots. Right. That, that is one of the bright spots of this Braves bullpen. It is pretty deep. You know, you could always use bullpen help, and, you know, your bullpen is never perfect, but this is one of the deeper bullpens, I think, in the MLB. So, whew, I'm going to take a deep breath because you told me to, Justin. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ease up on Tyler Maxick, and I'm going to relax a little bit when it comes to that. So, thank you for giving me some relief there. Staying in the bullpen, though, Justin, I think we know that a guy you just mentioned, uh, Iglesias, Raziel Iglesias, who the Braves just picked up in the trade deadline, He's definitely going to be the setup guy. And we saw that in the second game that the Braves won. We saw him be the setup guy for Kenley Jansen. But when we get into the postseason, and there are more and more high leverage situations that the Braves find themselves in, we can call back to when the Braves had Richard Rodriguez and they got him from the Pirates. They used him sometimes in the fifth inning or any other maybe high leverage situations earlier in the game. Do you think the Braves would all use him in maybe situations like that, similar to how they use Rich Rodriguez? in the fact that if there is a, you know, a situation that they really need to get out of in the fifth or sixth inning or, you know, maybe early in the game, do you see them bringing in Iglesias in maybe a spot like that? Yeah, sure. I think um, I think any time before Kenley Jansen, I think Kenley Jansen likes to fish the ninth and has been accustomed to that. But, I mean, baseball's changing in the way that you saw Buck Showalter a couple nights ago bring in Edwin Diaz for, you know, in the eighth because the Braves are going to have Swanson, Olsen, and Riley up, you know, the best bet. So I think high leverage is changing more from the time of game to the part of the order that you're entering. Um, so I, I can't see that for sure. And I think they've just got so much coverage otherwise if Kirby Yates returns and gives them something that is, is normal to his track record. Um, and they'll have AJ Minter, and then they'll have, you know, on, on the good days, um, other guys as well. So I, I can't see that because I think they're going to use him as a weapon. And that's, that's, I think that's why you acquire a former closer like that, not just so he can be the strict eighth inning setup man, but so you can deploy him in the sixth of the situation or in the seventh if you need him. And the postseason is all about shortening games in that way. Um, and so I think they can deploy him against, you know, in any, any number of spots because, you know, other than Penley, maybe, you know, he might have the best stuff in the bullpen now, uh, right, Kelly West is. And so I think they can be the guy they can use anytime before the nine, you know, with any situation, just to play him anywhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, if there's a situation that you need him, throw him out there. Like you said, Braves, I don't think will be scared to throw him out there at any point in time. It's Justin Toscano, guys. Follow him on Twitter at Justin C. Toscano. He's the Braves beat writer for the AJC, and he's joining us here on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game on the Hometown Take. Justin, going from relief pitchers to starting pitchers. Obviously, we got the news today, Ian Anderson, along with Guillermo Heredia is going to be optioned down to Triple A Gwinnett. And, you know, I think the writing on the wall was starting to come. I think the Braves held it off as long as they could. How long do you think Ian's going to spend? Have you heard anything on that? How, how long could we expect him to be in Gwinnett for? Uh, yeah, that's all. That's always tough to say. I mean, I certainly expect him to be ready for the postseason or, you know, a late stretch run and, you know, or even September. I just think for now... He's got to go down there and figure some things out. He's a guy with an ERA over five um, and a 1.543 whip. And so I just think that, I mean, he 
Look, he hadn't produced, and it's a lot easier to figure those things out and achieve some consistency of good results in terms of the box score against Triple A teams and not the Mets or you know any other contending teams. Right. It's easy for him to figure some things out, and plus it today worked for them because they needed a fresh arm because they burned a lot of those length guys throughout the first four games of the series. So they called up Foster. You know, uh, who uh, started two games for them earlier in the year, and the option came in April. So. I think it just made sense the situation. Uh, Ian will still start one of next Saturday's doubleheader games in Miami, so he's he's still going to be the 27th man for that doubleheader, but he's going to go down in the meantime and travel with the team. And so, I mean, I would I would say he'll be back before season, and I, I think they a guy with his stuff and his pedigree in terms of what he's done in the postseason through two years of his career. Um, I just think he, they, they need him. He's obviously going to be a big part of what they do, and they see him as a big part of what they do in the future. So I think I don't think it'll be too long, but I do think that they wanted to see him just figure some things out, throw some more strikes, get his mix on a little more. Uh, but it's easier to do that down there. Yeah, I'm with you, Justin. It's Justin Toscano joining us on the Wait4.com hotline here on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game in the hometown take. And... Again, he just needs a little bit of a confidence booster, and you do that better, like you said, down in Gwinnett than you do going up against the Mets or other teams like that that really, you know, are trying to contend for a playoff spot as well. So let's talk about the other side of that news. Um, you know what? Do you think this is maybe his last chance to prove himself on the, the big league level? If it doesn't work out this time around, Justin, do you think he potentially could be in line for a DFA if he doesn't have a good showing here? This one specifically, I don't know how much proving ground he's going to get. He's basically a fresh arm. Uh, they've got Jake Odorizzi kind of take the in spot for the meantime um, after that double header. So I'm not sure if you know he's going to get too much of a crack at it. But I do think it, yeah, this this last leg um, because of the options running out, like could be his definitely like his last stand. Um, and yeah, you look at when he you know punched the bench and broke his hand, and it just has kind of gone downhill. For him from there, and so um, yeah, I mean he's he's kind of entering that, but I'm not sure if this specific stint is going to be his last shot, just because I'm not sure how much he'll be used more than the next half. Okay, Justin, let's preview the game before we get you out of here. And again, I really appreciate the time. I know you're busy, got things to do. Obviously, we will see what Spencer Dr- Spencer Strider does against the Mets today. Hopefully, he's he's bringing the gas. He's bringing the triple digits on the uh, on the radar gun. Right now, though, do you think? He's the Braves' third best pitcher. Uh, right now, probably. I mean, I, Charlie has been able to do it consistently. Um, even though you'll still trust Charlie in the postseason for all that he's done, he, he's adapted many times on his career. Uh, and yeah, you know, Ian wasn't as good. Uh, we'll see what other is he can bring. But I think right now, if you look at starting pitchers, yeah, I think Strider's really right now your number three in terms of reliability and stuff. There it is, Justin Siscano joining here, joining us here on the WadeFord.com hotline on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game, Atlanta's Ford dealer. Justin, hopefully we get a win today, man. Enjoy the game. Don't work too hard. And thank you for spending a couple of minutes with us here on 92.9 The Game, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, 